everybody, and welcome. It's uh, it's only 13 minutes after noon. We're only uh, almost we're close. 15 minutes we're late. Close. <laughs> we're close. We're still dialing it in. <laughs> well, part of the reason we're late is I had to build a new set yes. to accommodate a friend. We have a special guest today. Is if if two is fun, three is probably going to be at least 50 percent more fun. <laughs> <laughs> so. we're counting on. No pressure. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody, this is Marlon Patton. Welcome to the show, buddy. And Thank you, guys. Of course. I, I'm always the one with the noisy mic. I'm the guy who actually lives at the studio. You would think I'd have time to fix these things. But no, of course not. Uh, if you don't know who Marlon is, you've been living under a rock. Um, Marlon is an Atlanta-based freelance drummer and engineer and studio home studio owner. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's part of the reason why we're here today. Uh, but before we get started, we got a little bit of housekeeping to take care of. Absolutely. Shane. Uh, if you don't already know, if this is the first time that you've uh, tuned in. This is the Dial a Drummer show. This is the live version. A lot of people don't realize yet there's a live version. And an audio version. And there's an audio version. So you can watch us live. You can listen to us live if you can't get the video. Or we produce a, a really nice, high-quality video and soon audio version that if you can't tune in um, uh, at Mondays at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time, Ish. Ish. <laughs> <laughs> well played. Oh, you're going to do so well today. <laughs> uh, if you can't tune in live, you can always watch or listen after the fact. Uh, all you have to do is hit any of the social networks and look for Dial a Drummer. We're Dial a Drummer on Twitter and Facebook and soon to be YouTube. Oh, that reminds me. If you're watching, or you're listening, please search for Dial a Drummer over on YouTube and subscribe to us. The only way we're going to get YouTube.com slash Dial a Drummer is we need at least 100 people to subscribe to our channel. All right, people, we then, need some help. Yeah, then we can secure Dial a Drummer as our channel name and our, our Do it right now. unique URL. I'm doing Look, it right this now. This guy's nice. high tech, y'all. <laughs> Total it'll be, it'll be number one. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, please, by all means, follow us everywhere. Uh, today, the call in lines are open, 844-833-3786. Uh, yeah, I'm going to get there soon. Or oh. drum. Or drum, uh, yeah. If you're if looking you, at your keypad. It yeah. spells out drum. You can uh, Feel free to call in. In fact, there's already some callers on the line right now that uh, we're, we're going to uh, get to in just a few minutes. And... Um, uh, let's see, what else? Oh, if you have questions during the week. In fact, today's discussion started because of a, a someone who emailed and asked a question. Nice. You can email us at uh, dialadrummer at gmail.com and see, I have all this stuff, and this is what, yeah, there, look at this. Check this out. So just tap that. Look at that. Oh, my gosh. Dialadrummer at gmail.com. Uh, if you'll email us, you can ask your questions, send in your comments, all that good stuff, or you can hashtag us dial a drummer on any of the social networks we kind of keep a monitor on that stuff and uh oh by the way that is shannon Corey. hello everybody good to see you again and, and this is and i'm brian stevens and this is our guest marlon Patton. and uh this mic's driving me nuts y'all sorry this is the not so professional part of me that just <laughs> <laughs> uh anyway so um we also have something else, and I'm trying to roll out all the new stuff right here at the beginning. Uh, we also have something else that's new this week. We have a sponsor. Nice. And uh, today's show is sponsored by Waves Audio and Waves Plugins. Uh, I've been using Waves Plugins now for more than a decade. I absolutely love them. Every single mix that I do has uh, a host of Waves plugins. Great programs. And, and, mm -hmm. and if you'll go to uh, dialadrummer.com slash waves, you can check out all of the awesome specials that they're running this month. And we have a very special plugin that's on a special sale price. I mean, like rock bottom. We're going to tell people about later, but you got to listen to the show to get the deal. To get the deal. We have a special URL that you can go to, and you'll be able to get this uh, amazing plugin. It is on every mix that I do. So a big thank you to Waves Audio for being a part of the show today. 
Yeah, for sure. And, and hopefully uh, they'll be around as a sponsor for a very, very long time. So we've established that this is Marlon Patton. And right. we're, we're not going to take a whole lot of time to go into your whole backstory. Mm -hmm. There's actually a great interview of, with you uh, on the Working Drummer podcast. Mm -hmm. Zach, yep. Yeah, if you, if, if you go to workingdrummer.net, and a shout out to uh, Zach Albetta mm -hmm. and Matthew Krauss for uh, the amazing podcast that they do. Mm -hmm. That's the wonderful thing about drummers and podcasts, even though there are tons of other podcasts to watch and listen to. Mm hmm it's a we're nice, not, we're nice not, tight circle. Uh, yeah, Everybody gets along nicely. We're not Absolutely. competition at all. No. If anything, it's just everybody brings a little something different to the table. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you want to get Marlon's whole backstory and hear all about who he is and what he does and really get in deep into the weeds on that, workingdrummer.net, and uh, search for the Marlon Patton episode. It's awesome. I've listened to it at least two and a half times. <laughs> Go after, check after him out this. live because he's an amazing player. Oh, thank you, man. Yeah, in fact, I just saw you Friday night. Friday, yep. Friday night with mm -hmm. the ATL Collective, mm -hmm. and you guys did from beginning to end the Beatles White Album. Huge undertaking, to say the least. Yeah, there was like at least a dozen people that had to play, right? Yeah. Play and sing. Yep, yep. Uh, Twenty musicians, all in all. Oh, good. And, uh, yeah, when uh, Robbie Handley is the music director for ATL Collective, when he asked me about it, I was like, oh my gosh, I'd love to. And then I started digging in, and I was like, wow, this is 30 songs. Mm. So, <laughs> quite the catalog. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> huge catalog. And, um, so, yeah, it was, it was a huge undertaking, but, uh, but Robbie absolutely nailed it uh, on the music directing side, just came up with all these great arrangements. And we had strings, and we had horns, and we had, uh, yeah, it was a sold out show. Yeah. People there to see our rendition of the White Album, which was kind of cool because uh, the Beatles never even performed the White Album. Right. Live, you know what I mean? So yeah, was, <laughs> to say it's an impossible task, it literally, the, the guys that made the record never did what you guys did. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not that they couldn't have, I'm sure, but it, right. was, it was just, uh, yeah. How it, many musicians did it take to pull it off? It was about, I think it was there was 20 all in all, but, you know, people were switching out and uh, we were adding some strings and adding some horns on some tracks, so... Uh, yeah, it was, it was about 20 people backstage just shuffling around. <laughs> but I was up there for 99% of it. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> now, now um, you guys doing that record mm -hmm. uh, start to finish, and you had to learn some very specific drum parts. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing about those parts is they're, they're iconic mm -hmm. and their content. <clears throat> um, now that you spent time with that record and had to learn those songs that way, mm -hmm. there, there's an age-old argument that uh, people have been asking questions about for decades and decades and decades okay. specific to the drums in this band. Mm -hmm. And I have to ask you, now that you've dug in deep into this material and having to learn it, mm -hmm. do you think that the Beatles' White Album is possibly, quite possibly, the best drum album that Bernard Purdy ever recorded on? <laughs> I mean, for my money. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, yeah. It's got some funk to it, for sure. Some, uh, some not, so wrong. not quite ringo -esque, but, uh, <laughs> No, I think actually Paul played some on that yeah. record. Yeah. And, uh, and maybe John. Yeah. And, I don't know, maybe Yoko, who knows? Yeah. Well, yeah, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the age-old you know, age question about, about drums in that band, obviously, is, you know, was Ringo a great drummer? And at one time, people thought he was the greatest drummer in the world. And mm -hmm. the running joke was, you know, the guys in the bands that he wasn't even the best drummer in the Beatles. Right, right. <laughs> but, uh, right. but I would imagine the one of the problems with learning that material is that the drums are so specific. Mm -hmm. Can talk about that for a second. What did you do to have to learn this material? Well, uh, actually, well, you saw I kind of was playing a big kit that night. And part of the reason was because... Um, you know, he did the tea towel thing on the toms, very dead, dry, low, tubby kind of toms. But then some of the stuff on that record has ringy toms. So I had like a 12 inch ringy, you know, coated head tom, then a couple of dead tea towel toms, and then another floor tom that was kind of ringy and a couple snares, just to try to cover all the different sounds. Yeah. But, you know, as far as being part specific, that stuff. I don't ever really notice the Beatles drum parts until I'm digging in to learn them. You right, know what I mean? Right, because right. like, the, and then you learn them, and then you're like, wow, that's really different. 
there are, there's a lot more to them yeah. when you actually dive into Exactly. Them. It's the kind of the, like somebody's like, yeah, we're playing a Beatles song. You're like, oh, yeah, I got that. And you're listening. You're like, oh, whoa. Right. I did not have that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well some of the parts are actually more complicated mm -hmm. once you actually get into them than you realize. Because, like you said, first listen, mm -hmm. you it's not what you're listening to. Right. You know, because it's kind of simple, if you will. But there's beauty in the simplicity of what he pulled off. Mm -hmm. And sometimes John, you know, would have these weird little time changes or like it'd go to six, eight or something like that, but Ringo just plows <laughs> through in <and> four, you know. <laughs> so. so the the reason that we had you on the show, other than the fact you're awesome oh, and you. uh, you're a drummer, and that's one of the qualifications for being on this show is that you're a drummer. Mm -hmm. It's a and, drum And show. you meet the height requirement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we, we had a question. We had a question from Dwight in Duluth, Minnesota this week, and Dwight is a 33-year-old drummer in a local band there, okay. and he was writing into the show to ask, as a guy who just plays in a band, uh, local band, some regional stuff, his question was, the other guys in his band, they have little home studios, guitar, bass, keys, where they record their demos for their songs, and mm -hmm. he was wondering if he should think about putting together a home studio mm. uh, for himself and for his band and and what were our thoughts on that and how possibly should he do it. And I thought we could turn that into a whole discussion that could help Dwight and everybody else uh, that listens or watches the show mm -hmm. about home studios. So I guess we could table that first uh, question or first part of the question, which is, what would be some reasons that a drummer would want to start his own or put together his own home studio? Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, it's, in my opinion, the one of the toughest things to record, right? I mean, we have, yeah, we have like the most microphones and the most preamps and the most stuff involved. And we're usually the first one up. Right. To record, right. you know, especially if you're doing a live project and, you know, the drums are usually the first to go down. First to go down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I I got into it just because I'm kind of a total gear nerd. I think you might be, too. I'm not. A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it might be a problem. Yeah. <laughs> it's a common problem we all have, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I, for me, it's, it's important because uh, because... Like I said, there's, it's one of the hardest instruments to record, and I just like to nerd out on uh, every different way to, you, you could possibly track drums. And then also with that, you obviously have to have more inputs, more microphones, so that kind of parlays itself into having just a home studio, yeah. basically. You know, right. you start recording drums, and you already have probably enough inputs to record a band. Right. You know? And it's a great way to start learning how to record. It's a great way to record yourself, especially in your early days when you're trying to improve upon your skill set, yeah. you know, because when you record it and you hear it back, that recording doesn't lie of mm -hmm. what you just yeah. put down. So it's oh, a great sure. way to, you know, and the great thing with technology today is there's, you can do it very affordably with digital boards. Things mm -hmm. have come a long way. I mean, you can go all old school analog and spend a lot of money, <laughs> yeah. but it, it's, a, it's an evolving process, much like our drumming vocabulary. You're constantly working on it and trying to improve upon it. But a great thing with a home studio is you get to start with yourself. Mm -hmm. And then the nice thing, too, is when you start working with bands, they get to come to you. Mm -hmm. And then you get to learn that skill set. Okay, how do I get a rec uh, guitar on record? Mm -hmm. right? How do I, you know, where's the right sweet spots on an acoustic guitar? You start learning all these nuances. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of the fun part of the game, too. I think also, in like... Further, what you're saying about the practice element of it is you get a much better feel for how your fills and your feel is translating Absolutely. within a song. Absolutely. You know? And your internal time. I mean, yeah. it's a great way to, okay, that feels good or, oh, mm -hmm. what are you doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? yeah. Oh, my God, I just repeated my same <laughs> fill eight times. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> but, you know, like a, we'll go, I'll dive into, you know, simple recording. You can, you know, you mentioned microphones. That mm -hmm. can get... You know, we like you said, we have the most amount of instruments to mic, but you can start simple with a, a good kick drum mic and a good overhead. Mm -hmm. And so two inputs, three inputs, depending on if you're running stereo overheads, you right. can that's a great way to start mm -hmm. recording right. drums. And some 
some of the best recorded drum sounds ever were done with simply like that. Speaking of Ringo. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. There's a great video if you search on YouTube of uh, Bob Clear Mountain and uh, Matt Chamberlain. I think mm -hmm. they did it for Apogee. Okay. And they basically did like a two mic setup or, uh, you know, overhead mic or maybe two overhead mics, like a stereo, and a kick drum mic, and that was it. Mm. And it's some of the most amazing drums that you'll hear on any kind of recording. Mm -hmm. I, I was kind of shocked. You know, they were basically showing off some of the smaller interfaces and touting the, the ability for people to record drums and not necessarily need 14 tracks. Mm -hmm. uh, I know for some of my students, one of the things that I do in that front room that you walked in, mm -hmm. it's a room that I practice in, but it's also a room that I do some teaching in. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I encourage my students to do is to have some kind of setup, even if it's just one overhead, and uh, a kick drum mic, you can get, uh, we've got a few two-channel interfaces floating around just this room. Uh -huh. uh, there's all kinds of great interfaces from Focusrite and Personas and Steinberg mm -hmm. uh, that just have a left and right in. You can plug in uh, any kind of condenser mic as an overhead mm -hmm. and get phantom power for it. You can get anything that would make a good kick drum mic, whether it's you know a $99 Audix mic all the way up to something like a D112 or Shure or mm -hmm. any of those companies that make great mics mm -hmm. for kick drums and, and get a usable sound and not really spend a lot of money. You know, if you already got a computer, um, especially if you have a Macintosh, for under 500 bucks, you can put that kind of setup together mm -hmm. and at least hear what your drums sound like about in the area where you are, mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, at least how the microphones hear it anyway, and uh, and get a good sense of the balance of the kit, you know, mm -hmm. when you're playing. Uh, obviously, you get to goose the kick drum a little bit if you need some more in the recording. A little sure. more boom, boom in your ears. Yeah. The mm -hmm. balance of the kit, that's a big one too. But I was noticing, I mean, you know, if, if you've got an older computer that still has Firewire on it, uh, I, was, I saw... Uh, was it alto.com, altomusic.com is blowing out these Focusrite Firewire interfaces that are have eight mic pre's and eight at for eight more mic pre's for like 250 bucks. Oh, wow. You know, and That's some wild. of the newer interfaces go for four to 600 bucks and you can get, you know, 16 channels into some of them. You can, yeah. uh, the, one of, the, one of the, the things that I usually tell people is to sort of start small Unless you've got some experience with recording mm -hmm. and, uh, and mics and technique and software and the whole thing, you know, start off uh, with something small with two mics. Even if you buy an interface that has more channels than that, just start off with two, work mm -hmm. with that, and then add a snare drum mic. SM57s you can get on Craigslist for 75 bucks. Right. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's not like you need a brand new one of those. You can hammer nails with that well, I thing. I think Shure's yeah, even got like a nice one. little mic pack that's got like 357s. Yeah. And their beta 52, mm -hmm. it's like 400 bucks for a basic little setup, yep. you know? Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. not unreasonable. And if you're in a band, uh, you know, maybe that's how you're, you're demoing your songs. You know, your, your guitar player starts to put together a tune and the singer comes by and puts a vocal on top of it. And then the, they ship it over, use Dropbox or We Transfer and send it to the bass player. And he puts his part on. Well, now, instead of just that silly drum loop that they're using, you can actually have them send you the files, mm -hmm. and then you could put some kind of drums on there that's you. And even if you're just using it for a demo, you know, mm -hmm. you're know you not gonna put it out through iTunes or Amazon or make CDs out of it. You can at least have some representation of what the song should sound like, mm -hmm. so that uh, when you get together and rehearse with the band, you can uh, have a better idea of what you should be doing in the song. And really, the thing I found out when I first started recording myself at home back in the mid-90s, mm -hmm. yeah, recording just with, with like a cassette four track, I started really noticing how much I wasn't listening to the song. Mm -hmm. I was listening to the drums. Right, right. But I wasn't really listening to what everybody else was doing. Right. But once you get that session there, whether you're in Pro Tools or... Garage band or whatever format that you're in, once you get that in there and you can just sit back and listen to what the guitar player's doing mm -hmm. and listen to what the bass player's doing and listen to the phrasing of the vocal, you know, where are the holes at the ends of the verses? Because mm -hmm. that's going to determine a lot of times how long a fill you should play. Mm -hmm. You know, the last thing you want to do, if you're a working player, we already kind of know that. Mm -hmm. But especially for somebody like Dwight, who's probably um, not quite as seasoned, like the last thing you really want to do is play a fill over top of a vocal, mm -hmm. especially if the singer writes the checks. Right. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> it's a good way to not get called back. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. We also learn in the language, too, I think, of, of you know, the DAW world. Yeah. Of, like, I mean, if, if, if your band, Dwight, if your band does go into the commercial studio, then you can, uh, you know, you'll have the demo already ahead of time. You'll kind of know your parts even better because you'll be listening back to them. And, uh, and also, you'll be able to communicate with engineers and producers that much better. Yeah. Yeah. Being the most, the more comfortable you can be in that environment, if you do go into a proper studio, mm -hmm. they're really, the thing I've found over the years is there's practicing your drums, and then there's practicing playing your drums in the studio. Mm -hmm. You know, playing your drums in your practice room is one style of playing. Sure. Playing your drums on a gig is at least one other style of playing. If mm -hmm. if you do a lot of different kind of gigs, it's twelve other styles of playing. Mm -hmm. But um, and then playing in the studio is at least unto itself a whole other way of playing drums. Mm -hmm. We were talking right before the show. You were talking about how you like to hear the drums mainly in ears. That's why you like to use in ears, right? So that you can hear the drums, at least how the mics hear the drums. Right. And that's what's so important to me about being in the studio and the difference between that and live. Live, I may, I may not worry about the mics at all. Mm -hmm. I may just play for what's the right sound and the right vibe. And sometimes that means really just whittling the drums to sawdust. Mm -hmm. Because for that gig in that venue, that's the way to play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, um, and and not even worrying about the mics. Mm -hmm. you know, other times, like with a festival, and you, if you got twenty thousand people at a festival or fifty thousand people at a festival, you're not going to play loud enough. So you let the mics do the work for right. you. Right, right. But in the studio, how the drums sound under the mics in that room at that moment, uh, with whatever uh, sticks you happen to be using, mm -hmm. and however you feel that day, uh, they can sound dramatically different than any other place that you play. Mm -hmm. And from studio to studio, different rooms, the drums will react differently to how you play. Mm -hmm. um, with, with a tighter room, you, you tend to have to kind of pull back a little bit because you can, you can overplay the room and kind of compress the air in the room mm -hmm. and get a smaller sound. Sure, you can certainly play too hard. Yeah. Just yeah. wash it all. Yeah. yeah. You guys know Aaron Sterling? Oh yeah, yeah. He's oh yeah. Awesome, awesome studio guy. He had a great quote of uh, where he said, uh, "Microphones are not ears." And a lot of times, even to our ears, a drum kit could sound great in a room, but like when you get it close mic'd and you get mics on it, it's a, it can be a completely different story. Yeah. Like a low detuned floppy snare drum might just not even be making a sound in the room barely, yeah. but but a mic close on it'll sound right. beautiful. Yeah. You know. So those, those are some of the little tricks that you can learn along the way of having your own studio yeah. as well. <laughs> and getting into getting to play with mic placement, mm -hmm. you know, how close you have a bass drum mic to the bass drum, whether it's inside, at the head, further back, right. you know, where you put your room mics, if you put them further back. I mean, it's, it's, it's fun to play around with the different sounds that you can get just by moving that microphone mm -hmm. around. Yeah, and how the tuning sometimes Reflects, can right. reflect the mic placement and all this. But tuning... That might be a topic for another show. Yeah. <laughs> That's a huge, a lot of guys don't spend enough time, I don't think, learning how to tune their drums. I agree. That's Especially a... on the fly, if you have to detune to make it sound better for a particular set of microphones right, right. or the particular track, right. you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. Right. Let's talk about our different recording spaces. Uh, Shannon, we'll start with, with yours. Okay. I'm going to show a few pictures while, while you're talking about your, your recording space. And uh, so let's talk about your personal recording space that you're in. Okay, so what I did is I actually built a standalone studio at our place. And it's an, I've got a nice live room. I've got a control room, vocal booth, and then a nice storage closet for all the gear. Oh, yeah. yeah. Important. Um, so what you're looking at here is one end of the control, I'm sorry, my live room, which I can put up to about a nine piece band in there and actually be able to track. I've got a 24 track studio at the house. I'm using a Personas 24 channel live, the AI board. Nice. And I am using the Studio One. You know, I dabble with the uh, Cubase and I can run Pro Tools. Uh, here's another shot of the control room. And then... Here's my live kit. 
I've been with Trick Drums for 20 years, so that's my main go-to live kit. Nice. And I use a big, big kit for the studio, so I have all the sounds at my disposal. So I'm running an 8, 10, 12, <clears throat> 8, 10 up top, 14, 16 on the right as floors, a 12 on the left, and a 20-inch kick generally. That should cover it. And then there's the other end of the live room, and then what you're looking at there, the window, that's my vocal booth, and then the doors into the storage closet there. Is this in your basement? It's actually yeah. a standalone building out oh, on my awesome. property. We've got some, we've got 10 acres, so we got a big old barn, oh, studio. Awesome. Yeah, it's oh, a nice place. place. So it, it's, you know, I can record it anytime, day or night. I can do drum tracks for a lot of folks. I've done that for years. I started out, you know, kind of like we're talking about, it was more of a project studio, and then it developed into a bigger, I realized, hey, I can have everybody in my place. It makes life a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, you know, talking about recording and sound, I think it also helps you develop listening better to a band. Because mm -hmm. we end up being musical directors for the most part. Because because we go first, we're, we kind of learn the songs first mm -hmm. and the most intri intricately. Um, recording really helps you listen outwardly, where I think by the time you get to the gig, you're not... You know what you're doing, and mm -hmm. you're not really listening to yourself anymore. You're really trying to make the band drive mm -hmm. and make it sound the best they can go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can kind of get outside of yourself. Exactly. And hear the whole picture a little yeah. better, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. You want to jump so, on a caller? You want to talk uh, yeah, about? Yeah. Let's, okay. let's, let's just jump into a call here a second. All right. Hello. Who's on the call in line? It is. It is me. George, George Sandler. George. The third time. <laughs> What's up, George? Time charm, gentlemen, that's what I have to say. Not much, man. How about you, Shannon? I'm doing great, brother. Good to hear from you. Good to hear from you guys, too. Like what you guys are doing. It's awesome, man. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. So uh, you, you just you actually just put a home studio together recently, right? I did. Uh, about last year, I think I got all the moving parts and the gear that I needed after much consultation and asking more, asking people that I felt were smarter than myself about what I should do, you know, and how I should approach it. I knew what I wanted to do with it, which I knew what I didn't want to do, which was to make it a commercial studio where people come and live bands come and do that. I strictly wanted to be a drum percussion slash loop creation studio, whatever, for clients that I could email files to or what ha have you, just drum files, percussion, whatnot. So how did that influence your, your choices about the gear that you bought? Um, I didn't end up getting as many I, – I, I'm recording right now 12 channels of live drums at one time. Okay. I don't have to worry about having another room where clients can go and play guitar or whatever. I just have a big – a larger – larger than normal basement – bedroom that I have my stuff in and I didn't have to um I, I just felt like it, it it was easier for me to start this way I didn't spend I didn't scrimp really I spent about I don't know I think all all told it was all about seven to eight thousand dollars what I spent and you could you could seriously go another way sure sure but I wanted to have you know, some guys, the one of the biggest questions I had was, do I want a console? Do I not want a console? And after discussing it with people, I do like to have a little console. So I have an X32 yep. Behringer with those great sounding preamps in it. Yep. It's a good choice. Yep. And, it, and, it, and it speaks to my Macintosh like, it's, like, like they're twin brothers. Yeah. You know? And, and my thing was ease of use, too, Brian. I wanted to walk downstairs and flip two switches, yeah. and I'm in. Mm -hmm. I, I tell you, 12 years ago, when I, when I put the studio, I, I had a commercial facility for five years in Duluth, and I uh, had about a 20, 25-minute commute, and the moment that I bought a house and put a studio in it and made my commute two flights of stairs, my life got instantly better. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, 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 you know, with like you were telling, I, I remember you telling uh, a second ago about what, whether you should have a space. I actually think you should have, every drummer should have a space. And with the advent of gear that sounds good and does the job that doesn't cost. I mean, you remember when you first had to get a studio, you were talking about a $25,000 minimum investment. Oh, yeah. That's true. <laughs> you know, with tape machines and everything you had to have just to do the job. Right. And now, like you said, if you've got a decent Macintosh computer, you can get an interface yeah. and do it, like Marlon said, with three mics. Yeah. 
Well, even uh, uh, downstairs, I'm running Pro Tools HD, and I remember uh, in the early 2000s, if you were going to get into a pro a, a pro level Pro Tools rig, you were going to spend fifty thousand bucks. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least. Oh yeah, easy. Yeah, and so uh, and. And there were interfaces that you could use, you know, in the late '90s and early 2000s. I certainly bought plenty of them. I but, didn't need uh, that. Yo, you were right. Man, yeah. yeah. And you thought you were big time if I you know. had two. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> you oh, had buddy, 16 yeah. tracks. All right. And you remember when, when Avid, you couldn't use any interfaces, but the Avid interface. Right. Right. Nothing else was compatible. Right. Right? They made it so that nothing else was really compatible, and you were kind of stuck with whatever they charged you because it was like, well, you want this, you got to use this. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in their minds, in their minds, especially, you know, if you if you were a, a pro level user, then you you could probably afford a pro level price price point, and uh, you know that may or may not be true. But George, are there any questions that you were left with? Uh, questions you want to pose at us after you know beginning to put together home studio? I would love to pose a question. I'm I'm pretty set with my microphones, but I'm looking to purchase. I, I, I've got, you know, Sennheisers for the toms and SM81s for the overheads, and you know, good, I, I feel like I'm good with microphones. There's a couple things I do have a question about. I have a I'm using SM57s top and bottom, but I'm looking for an alternative for maybe another top mic just to have that that different sound and I was looking at maybe a Telefunk and M80 but is there any other snare mics you recommend that won't break the bank but sound great I've actually been using uh, you, it looked like you had a couple advanced audios downstairs mm -hmm. oh yeah they're uh, CM it's their pencil condenser mic yep. that's yep. Uh, I can't remember the model number on it right now but uh, it's not too expensive and uh, I'd say in addition to a 57 it's kind of nice to have a small diaphragm condenser uh, to be able to pick up a snare, uh, it's a very it's a very different sound. On the bottom, on the top, on, I, I yeah. use it on the top. Okay, cool. And you can also use it if you just line up the capsules, use it in mm -hmm. conjunction with a 57, and then get you know more of that top end on the on the condenser, and then obviously what the 57 does, and they and they they can blend together really well. There, there's actually usually when I'm recording, if, I'll sh I'll show it to you if you haven't seen it before downstairs. There's actually, George, there's a clip that you can get. I think it's called an X clip. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it basically, it clamps onto your 57 or your whatever dynamic mic you're using, and it has a smaller clip built onto it that you can put a small diaphragm condenser in. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. So you can use one stand and have both mics. It's like 12 bucks or something. And it, another mic that I've had good results with, George, is the old EV 308s or the 408s mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they have a little more low end. In them, yep. they sound great on the top snare head, mm -hmm. especially depending on if, if you're goofing around with different tunings. Because I know you do a, you know, you, you do a fair amount of contemporary country stuff, and sometimes you got to tune that stuff a little it, it, lower. It, it varies, mm -hmm. yeah. Contemporary country down here in my studio, I'm doing everything, but yeah, I, I just I switch out snares just like you guys do, just about every song. Nice, mm -hmm. yeah. There's a, there's one mic that I use as a replacement for a 57 made by a company called Gage. It's not 12 gauge, mm -hmm. the company that makes mics out of 12 gauge <laughs> shotgun <laughs> cartridges. <laughs> <laughs> I swear, they, this, there's a company out there called 12 gauge something or other that makes microphones. They take uh, they take shotgun uh, shell cases and make microphones See, out of them. That's the advantage to a home studio though, when you're totally not feeling the track, you're on your own time, so you can walk away, go eat a sandwich and come back. Uh, right. But there, there's a different company called just called Gage Microphones, and they make uh, it looks a lot like some of the h real high-end handheld condensers, kind of like a Neumann or something like that. Mm. Uh, uh, but it's a handheld dynamic mic that they make that's maybe about 120 bucks. that's uh, a lot like a 57. It's got a little bit more of a top boost on it. It's a little more open. Uh, it's, it sounds a lot like if you, you there's a mod you can get for a 57 mm -hmm. where they basically pull some guts out of it and make it a straighter connection, you know, from for, right from the diaphragm right out the back of the mic. Right. Kind of thing. Um, it sounds a lot like a, a lot like a modded fifty-seven. So uh, check out those gauge microphones. Uh, on the recorded version of this, I'll put a picture and a link and all that kind of stuff uh, that people can go check it out. That's one of the alternatives that I'll use. What does that run? Do you know, like one hundred twenty-nine bucks or really? something. It's Not a little bad. more expensive, yeah. but it's a little bigger. It's a little bigger, a little more robust than a fifty-seven. Okay. Um, hmm. 
and you, it, has a, it has a windscreen on it, kind of like a 58, but I usually unscrew that. Okay. Um, and then there's a, oh, wow. okay. there's a, there's a buyer dynamic that I use and I can't think of the name, the model number of it right now. I want to get, get one of those. Actually, I love most everything buyer makes. Yeah. So I'm sure yeah. that, I mean, I've used it in other sessions before, but yeah. I don't own one, but it's yeah. kind of like almost looks like a condenser, but yeah. it's, a, it's a dynamic. Yeah. Mic. It's a yeah. dynamic. Mic. It, looks, it looks just like a condenser. It's black and round and looks like a pencil condenser kind of thing, but it's a dynamic up. mic and I'll, I'll swap it out. Sometimes I'll put it on the top. Other times I'll put it underneath and use it for the snares. Um, I've got probably a dozen different microphones that I use for underneath. Is that it? The M201. Yeah. I bet that's what it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've got a bunch of different mics I use underneath because I find uh, most people think that underneath the snare drum is just the sizzly part of the snares, but mm -hmm. you can really get a lot of different sounds if you're using a, a 57 underneath the snare mm -hmm. or a small diaphragm condenser. I've got one of those MXL cube mics. It has a different sound to it. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I'll put uh, an E609 S Silver, a Sen Sennheiser mic that you usually use on guitar cabinets. The mm -hmm. other thing to be careful with is proximity. If you're running a top and a bottom snare mic and a hi-hat mic, be careful that those three mics aren't so close to each other that you're phasing each other out mm -hmm. either. Because sometimes you can do away without the hi-hat mic. Oh, yeah. Because the snare and the overheads will pick up plenty of hi-hat. Well, that raises an interesting question I, that I'd, I'd like to pose to you guys. So I put up a hi-hat mic most of the time, almost all the time when I'm recording. Mm -hmm. Rarely do I ever use it. Yeah, right. same. Do you ever, I, same? I, generally, I don't use one anymore because right. I have found with the overheads, and if you're trying to get that huge deep sound out of your snare with two mics, you, it's, it's just too much. I agree. And I'll, also, I tend to play it softer. I play the high hat softer. The only reason why I have one is because I went to most of my potential clients and said, what do you want? And nine out of 10 of them said, Hey man, give me everything you got. Okay. And, you know, some guys were like, ah, just give me kick snare overheads and Tom and you, and you know, two toms. And even some of them want a stereo Tom mix. They don't want the four toms. They want stereo, but you know, I, I personally, I agree with you. It, it's, it's a lot of times you can get everything out of the hi hat that you need, especially if you're using bigger, like I'm using 15s for the most part. Yeah. I have a set, I have a, a bunch of different ones, but 15s get picked up quite nicely with the, with the left side overhead and the hi hat and the snare drum mic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So definitely. It's just, it's just what they, I, I give the client what they want and I go, okay. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. that's and that's kind it. of the fun part too, experimenting with the sounds based on the size of your room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like George is saying, the size of your hi-hats. Right. You know, if you're playing 15s, 13s, 14s, or, you know, you're doing the Steve Jordan thing and playing 16s or 18s, mm -hmm. it really depends, so. Yeah. yeah, I got a pair of crash cymbals that I love for hi-hats. My 16s are just awesome. Nice. Yeah. yeah, killer. Cool, cool. George, hey, thanks for calling, buddy. And guess what? Because you called in, you want to give him the, uh, the Steve Smith DVD? Yeah, let's do it. Hey, so George, since you called in, Steve Smith, man. <laughs> nice. we have a copy of Steve Smith. Hold it up to uh, hold up your camera right, right. there, Shannon. And I'll uh, I'll show that to everybody. The uh, Steve Smith drum set techniques and the history of the U.S. beat. Thanks to uh, our friends at Hudson Music, Mr. Rob, Rob Wallace, Wallace, and uh, the folks at Hudson Music. We're gonna make sure, George. I've got your address. We'll uh, we'll send you a copy of, of that Steve Smith DVD because you called in and you talked to us on Dial the Drummer today. Mm -hmm. Appreciate you calling, George. Man, thank you. You guys are doing this. I love this stuff, man, and I agree with you more than you know. Guitarists and usually guys like that are kind of not. You know, dude, I don't I don't want to show anybody my settings. I don't want to tell anybody what I'm using. But drummers, for the most part, we're pretty open and and open to sharing. And this is just another great example of that. Yeah, for right sure, on, man. Appreciate cool. that. Well, thanks for calling, George. Well, I'll see you around soon. Thanks, sure. guys. See you, George. Take yes, care. Yes, sir. See you guys. Later. It's definitely agreed, though. Drummers are definitely a cooler hang. Mm -hmm. There's no a lot less ego in the room because yeah. every because it's it's one instrument that it's you take the three of us. Mm -hmm. We play the same beat, but it's going to have three different things exactly. because everybody different. brings their own mojo to it. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's that's a very cool thing that it's. A lot less ego driven. I, I think it's the nature of the instrument too. We sit in the back and we support, you yeah. know, 
and then that that leads to having I, I don't think you can have as much of an ego as it, you know maybe if you're up front sure. taking solos or singing or whatever being the lead singer if you will it's a very different mindset I that's think. a great and, point yeah, yeah I think we're we're more supportive and therefore we can share we don't care about sharing our secrets <laughs> there's so it. much to learn anyway you know absolutely well let's uh, let's shift for a second and back into what we were talking about before George's call we need if we to go could. show Marlon's place yeah yeah so I've got a few pictures of Marlon's place and we're gonna throw a few of those up there for you so uh, you can see what I'm showing the people there Marlon why don't mm -hmm. you talk about uh, your your drum setup this is one of your drum setups yes yeah, so talk about what we see in there this was something that I was doing for a, um, a jazz record but um, it was actually it's the records not out yet but it was a recording I was doing and I'm, I'm very fortunate behind there in that room. I don't think I have any pictures of it, but uh, behind that glass door there is a nice grand piano. Um, and nice. uh, I have enough, sort of the the studio is sort of started taking over the house as it does, but. Um, I, I, I feel your pain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that just makes it home. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a, a nice little CNC 18 inch kick and a, uh, um, these Camco toms, uh, twelve and or yeah, twelve and sixteen. Yeah, the Camcos, man. I, I don't know what it is about those toms, but they're just so special. Um, and I got a couple of Spitzicino ride cymbals. Oh man, that's the good stuff. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah. R.I.P. Roberto. Yeah, yes. Right. And then uh, I'm gonna, I get. I think those are those sixteens going on there. But uh, miking wise, I got a pair of coals up oh, over the yeah. kit. Um, I'm kind of a, a ribbon freak when it comes to overheads and, mm -hmm. and rooms and anything kind of off the kit. Yeah. Um, and then let's see, we got uh, some CAD E100s. Oh yeah. Which are fantastic mics on the uh, toms. I got a. I got that advanced audio on the snare. I got an M160 bear on the hi hat, mm -hmm. and I do like to do hi hat when I'm doing jazz stuff, just sure. to just to get the chick, yeah. you know, just to have that little backbeat kind of going two and four going sure. on. Sure. And then um, yeah, so this is this is kind of a thing I've been working with of like uh, closer sources, darker sources getting brighter mics, and brighter sources getting darker mics. There you go. Yeah, so like, you know, ribbons on the cymbals, ribbons on the on the hat, ribbons on the room, and then close up, maybe use some condensers on the toms and drums, get the ring. Open get the, it up. Yeah. Get the, you know. That's nice. Get yeah. that brightness back. So uh, this this next picture is from behind the drums looking at your room. Mm -hmm. So talk about the room that you have for recording drums. Yeah, it's, you know, it used to be a, uh, it's on the back of the house. It used to be a, a porch that they enclosed, and then I ended up building that wall sliding glass door. And if you look at the sliding glass door to the right side of the door, there is a uh, vocal booth. So mm -hmm. it's kind of split in half. And on the left side, there's another little room where I can track bass, upright bass, or anything cool. like that. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, I just did some diffusion, some, 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 uh, you know, light acoustic treatment and stuff like that. Um, yeah, you know, I found the, the the cheapest way to do it is to just get that, uh, stiff 703 board and yep. just build little Frames out yep. of one by mm -hmm. uh, one by four, and um, and then burlap material over the front, stretch it over the over the frame, staple it on the back, and and you can do one piece if you want. You know, I guess it's two inch thick. Two pieces if you want it four inch thick. Mm -hmm. And I just built a whole bunch of those, and you know, kind of clapped around my room, found where there was flutters, found where there were you know weird bass traps, and uh, just kind of tried to make the room sound as flat as I could. Sure. But that 703 stuff, I mean, it's so it's so good and it's so much cheaper than going the the Orlex route. Yeah. I feel like you know. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Yeah. Uh, and it kind of it's fun to create your own stuff too, and it gives your place some character too. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I noticed that your ceiling. Talk, talk about your ceiling for a second in that picture. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like just a flat kind of ceiling. Mm -hmm. Was that already like that, or did you do something special? It actually was already like that, but the. The wall at the other side is also on an angle. Um, I built that on an angle, so it, you know, try try to keep from you know hitting a flat wall. Flat right, surfaces, nice. I guess. Yeah. Like I said, when we were setting up, I wish I had higher ceilings. That's one thing that's beautiful for recording drums to be able to really get the mics up off of them. But did you have to do anything special with the floor, like float the floor or anything like that? No, it was a, I kind of lucked out with the space. It was mm -hmm. it was a concrete floor oh, already. Yeah. yeah, nice. You know, it sounds good. I just put a carpet down. And, um, get enough reflection, but it's also not too too crazy. That's, uh, I'm gonna show a shot of your control room here, mm -hmm. and uh, people can kind of see some of the the setup in there. So you're basically you're 
you said this was a, a, like a closed-in porch is where your drum room is. So I mm -hmm. guess those windows would, would used to be exterior windows or something? Yeah, correct, yeah. It looks into the, that, that, I guess, would be a dining room if somebody normal lived in that house. <laughs> 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 and uh, that looks right into the drum room. So, um, you know, I, when, if, I do also just engineer sometimes out of the space. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's where I would sit, just engineer. But sometimes I just run back and forth and record myself playing drums on people's tracks. So, but it, you know, the setup of the house just kind of worked out pretty well. And yeah. to be honest, when I was looking at the place, I was already had the wheels turning. That know. was the first thing you saw was <laughs> where was, can the yeah. studio go? Windows. <laughs> yes. That's it. <laughs> it. One of the stories my wife tells about us finding this house is the real estate agent. We we hammered real estate agents and nobody could really find what we were looking for. This one guy got it. So he, he said, I have the perfect house for you. We walked in this front door, and I, immediately I said, point me to the basement. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I, went, I went through the front door. I went maybe 12 feet. I hooked it downstairs into a totally unfinished basement. I looked around, looked at how the thing was, and I looked at how deep it was. I kind of stepped it off a little bit. And I looked at the the uh, real estate agent and said, "We're going to take this one." Nah. <laughs> my wife, my wife looks at me. She's got this this. Her face is completely white, like she'd seen a ghost. And she goes, "Can we at least look at the rest of this house?" <laughs> <laughs> and you were like, "Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Make yourself happy, baby." <laughs> you know. But the, yeah, this uh, we definitely bought this house um, and and the studio for me at least the studio and. Uh, Trying to be a good dad, the school system mm -hmm. was a, was a huge consideration for mm -hmm. us in getting this this house because it really was a blank canvas for me able to do what I did did downstairs, which yeah. we'll, we'll talk about it just a little bit. But yeah. let's let's keep going. So I, I pulled a few pictures off your website. Mm -hmm. So your rack that that's here. Let's uh, for all the geeky people that are taking notes and wanting to look at gear and and maybe look at some options. What interface are you using? Okay, so I have a RME. Fireface, and I, I really love RME stuff. Uh, yep. Their clocking is fantastic, and more importantly, their drivers are the most rock solid, I think, in the oh, business. Yeah. Like, they nev it never fails me, yeah. ever. Um, the computer will slow down, things like that will happen, but it will never lose. It, it's always locked right in. And then uh, linked up to that, so that has eight ends, then uh, fire. I mean, not fire away, ADAT, uh, light pipe, it has eight more, mm -hmm. and then uh, Spadiff, it has two more. So I'm running 18 inputs. Okay. And then the uh, the links down there is covering the additional eight, and then I have an API A2D that's covering the additional two. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So. And so you're using all of those to get into your RME. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Yeah, and then it's, it's all clocked with that uh, big bin down there. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, just a bunch of 500 series toys up, up top. Yeah, there. yeah, I grabbed another one of those pictures. You've got yeah. some nice API stuff sitting in there. Yeah, I love that stuff, yeah. man. I really do. Um, the, on, the only thing I wish they had was an output level because they're so yeah. hot. They are hot. Yeah, I often pad the uh, the output into the converter so I can turn up the, the preamp a little bit more and get a little bit more of that mojo from them. And so I saw you in your pictures, you have a tape machine. I do, yeah. What do you use your tape machine for? Well, I mix to it, or sometimes I will bounce individual tracks to it, or sometimes a drum bus. So like okay. a stereo, nice. bounce stereo, because it's just a two-track machine, but yeah. it's a great old MCI quarter inch. Yeah. Warms it up nicely. It does. It just tames those transients a little bit, gives a little natural compression. Yeah. So. Yeah. So with, uh, with the stuff that's in your rack of gear. Mm -hmm. um, what was the thought process and the things that you picked? Did you just kind of find things you like and it built it over time? I or did. was there some other method? No, I, I think, well, the advantage to the 500 series thing is, uh, you know, just kind of get one thing at a time. And uh, I mean, I just had the, the lunchbox and the one API in there just glaring at me. Like, <laughs> you know. Needing a little brother. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, man, need I need more friends. I need a friend. <laughs> Just, I had, you know, start off, it's like, I mean, those things are 750 bucks a pop. Yeah. It's nothing to, nothing to shake a stick at. But I, uh, I got one. I really liked the way it sounded. I started, you know, I feel like I always wanted at least pairs of everything. Yeah. Especially as a drummer, you know, you yeah. want to have, at least be able to do a stereo set of things. Yeah. So that was what, I, you know, then I got two, and then I got two more. And I got two more. <laughs> <laughs> At least you kept the rule together. Yeah. Pairs of pairs of pairs. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. 
That's cool. Yeah. So, uh, uh, what software platform are you using? I use Pro Tools. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just most comfortable with yeah. it, you know, especially editing and, and uh, you know, pretty quick in it at this point. So, yeah, I've you, tried Logic and I just I can't. Um, I, I know Logic is, is probably a very, like a deeper program um, as far as what you can do with it. But uh, I don't know. Just don't have patience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I've had a few sessions the past few weeks. Downstairs, we've got pretty much every platform except for Digital Performer. And mm -hmm. uh, had a few different people that brought a bunch of Logic stuff in. And I had to reconfigure my mind a little bit mm -hmm. to be able to think about Logic. I, I even found myself hitting the, the Pro Tools key commands going, no, no, it's this other key. Mm -hmm. It's this other thing. So mm -hmm. Sometimes it's hard for me to shift. Do you use Ableton nice. or anything like that? That is something on my list of things to learn because it seems like that's becoming kind of a thing that drummers do yeah. on, on big stages now. So, yeah. Another uh, yeah. service we have to provide. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But getting back to your question about mm -hmm. what, why I chose what I chose, I, I have to say I went with um, very industry standard stuff. Right. I mean, I, I paid attention in a lot of sessions and, and asked a lot of questions, hopefully not too many questions engineers out there they, they love questions <laughs> yeah <laughs> but um you know i don't think you'll find an engineer in the world that wouldn't say that apis are aren't good on drums right you know what i mean right. So, right. so i started out with that and then branched off into my own kind of thing but definitely went with industry standard stuff cool yeah shannon with your setup mm -hmm. I'll, I'll show a few of these other the pictures of your control room setup Kind of going back to where we were talking with yours, you're using the uh, the studio live mm -hmm. in your your setup. Was there a reason why you picked that? Well, I've I've changed, run the gamut over the years, where you used to have a rack full of everything, yeah. this and that piece. Um, I kind of simplified, it, especially with the advance of the digital boards. So I've had the studio live for about a year and a half, and I love the simplicity of it as far as input output, yeah. um, and it just allows for my space, because I can control everything from the drum set. I've got a snake running through the wall that matches all the inputs of that particular board. It was made specifically for the Studio Live board, which is nice. That's great. Yeah. So I can control everything from the iPad at the drum set, so I'm not stuck in the control room and having to run out, mm -hmm. you know, catch the first eight clicks and <laughs> hope I'm in the right spot. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it just simplified my setup, because originally when I did the studio, it was more of a place to practice and you know record myself mm -hmm. that whole thing and then it i i did make the space big enough and i was smart enough with so in that shot there if you look at the vocal booth i did put in an angled walls yep mm -hmm. my ceiling is at an angle mm -hmm. and it's um t11 siding yep so it's a nice reflective surface mm -hmm. what i did on the walls instead of doing sheetrock which is a really loud and, and then you end up having to treat it mm -hmm. So I did. Well, my dad and I built the studio together. So what we did is we put insulated it, put pegboard up, and then put carpet over oh, the pegboard. Okay. So the carpet diffuses it. If it gets through that, then it diffuses through the pegboard, and then it's still insulated. Oh, nice. So Makes it's sense. a really nice flat sounding room, uh -huh. but it's a live sounding room, and mm -hmm. it's it's a very nice. I get a lot of great sounds out of there. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what are you doing as far as micing your drums? Uh, mic wise, mm -hmm. um, so I'm using the Shure Beta 98s on yep. the toms. I've got, I'm using the Shure VP88, which is a really nice stereo microphone. Yep. Um, and then I'll run 57s on the snares. Yep. Um, I tend to like the D112 a little better on the kick drum. I do have some Beta 52s, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I started with the D112, and to That's me, it's, it's a little more warmth to my ears. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It so, has that scoop that's right for the bass drum. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's just yeah. there's something sweet about it because you can doesn't matter where you are, or what room, it just it's mm -hmm. that sound, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah, it just it they're yeah they're ready made for kick drums. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm in there and like yourself, I have there. a lot of microphones mm -hmm. to choose from, but I yeah. I pretty much tend to stick with the shores on the drums. Right. Cool. Well, what about uh, your overheads? What are you doing with your overheads? The, uh, the VP88, yeah, which okay, is a short. Talk about that a second. So the VP88 is a stereo overhead that Shure makes okay. and you can change the polar pattern on it it's got it's a switchable yeah which is really nice so you can you know depending on the size of the spread you want you can get really dial in the sound cool. and then I'm running a couple of different room mics and I'll play with those yeah. depending on 
it, like you do, you'll play with different sounds. So yeah. that, that kind of varies. And what software are you using to, to run all that? Um, I, re I do Pro Tools, I do Cubase, and I've been dabbling with the studio one. Cool. That came with the board. That's, that's, that's a, a nice program. Yeah, that's a robust that's a, program. Yeah, it really I mean, is. A lot of people say good things about Studio One. It's easy to use and it's uh, very user friendly. Yeah. As far as you know, if it's a great place to start, if you especially for these guys that we're trying to talk to that don't want to start a home studio, right. mm -hmm. the Persona Studio One software is really nice and it's it's pretty heavily loaded yeah. with stuff to use. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't jump into the Pro Tools game right out of the gate. Yeah. Yeah, our buddy Jeff Mills, he's running a studio live with the Studio One software, and he's been getting a ton of mileage out of that. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's been doing drum tracks. helped him put his uh, room together and everything, and he's been doing some drum tracks and stuff, but now he's branched out into doing songwriter demos. I think he did some ADR for uh, uh, for some kind of independent film recently. So he's he's kind of seeing where this, this whole idea of an, uh, multiple income streams, being able to work on different projects in different roles is... Is a, is pretty valuable mm -hmm. to be able to do do that kind of thing. So, let's talk about your place. Let's talk about my place. So, we got another. We're hour. gonna start with this. We're talking about home <laughs> studios. However, you started more as a commercial studio when you had your commercial space, correct? Yeah. Well, even going back further than that, like I say, in my in my apartment and on the recorded version of this, I'll put some pictures up. Uh, in my apartment in Norcross, when I first moved here, I had a little setup in the corner of the living room. First I started with just like a cassette four track and uh, a couple of little effects boxes and some microphones. And then eventually I ended up getting a computer, but it wasn't to record. They really didn't have audio. And like 96, 97 audio at an affordable rate was still not great. Affordable. In, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You couldn't really do that with a computer very well. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. What I was using the computer for was as a, a MIDI device. Okay. So I had a drum cat, and I would MIDI into the computer, and I would uh, use a, a D4 to uh, trigger my sounds when I was playing, so I wouldn't have, because back then the latency was awful in the computer. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would monitor tracking MIDI drums with real cymbals. Um, Ugh. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, and, and a lot of times with the cymbals, I would do it like Stuart Copeland style. I would do all the drums and stuff first and then knock off those MIDI tracks mm -hmm. and then go back with one microphone and just play like just the hi-hat oh, and just wow. the crash cymbal. And then uh, <laughs> talk about it, it, tedious, mm -hmm. yeah. crazy tedious. So mm -hmm. I, the first couple of years that I had a, a little recording set up, like 97, 98, um, I just had that little setup, and then uh, I got a couple of the M-Audio Delta interfaces, the 1010s, way back in the day. I got a, a few of those, and I ended up taking on a business partner, and we put a little studio in his basement. And, you know, we ran with two Delta 1010s for probably a year or two, and then we moved into a commercial space. And for about five years, yeah, I, I, we really we had a, a large A studio downstairs, and then we also had the upstairs where we had a mastering suite and a MIDI production suite. And uh, I had guys that moved in there and did some work out of there for me. And I, around 2000, about 2005, I started seeing the recession coming. And I was coming to the end of my lease. So I thought, you know, instead of renewing my lease, uh, everything here is paid for. And I've got a little money in the bank. How about I buy a house? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so about uh, 12 years ago now, we bought this house. And I had a guy come in and... and uh, I'll start just kind of showing some pictures as we're talking. I uh, had a contractor come in and build in the downstairs, had him build using that room within a room concept. We floated the ceilings. I had a concrete slab. So mm -hmm. uh, that's a picture, of, one of the pictures of the, the live room with, the, with some of the drums in there. Uh, for my drum geeks, I'll show you a few different pictures of the drums. So that's my Gretsch USA Customs, the main kit that I usually record with. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and you can kind of see another view from the other side of the room there. Uh, and it's just, yeah, it's a nice size room that you can fit it's at so least. so tidy. Yeah, yeah. Well, we were taking pictures that day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not quite as tidy if you go down there now. Um, but yeah, so the whole idea was I wanted a room that was big enough that uh, I could actually get some room sound. That's the problem with being in a bedroom right. is if, if you're sitting next to the mattress, it sucks up a lot of good sound and you really don't, you don't have the ability to do a lot of things. So mm -hmm. you're talking about making your panels. So these panels that I have on the wall that you see are actually on a cleat. 
so you can pull them off of the wall. Oh, cool. So, and they're movable. So uh, if I want a really live sound, we can pull any of the sound panels in this room off cool. and uh, have the bare wall. And uh, when they built this, all of the walls have a slight, like a three to five degree angle. Even though it looks like the walls are just normal, they're on a slight pitch. Oh. So they're slightly not parallel. Nice. Uh, and then all the ceilings in all my different rooms, the ceilings are actually suspended ceilings. So they built a frame with nodes. And so from the joists on the floor, up from the floor above, which is about 14 feet above this, mm -hmm. this whole area, um, they actually floated the ceiling. Oh, that's great. So I, I could have had higher ceilings, but then we would have had to put the ceilings right on the, the joists for the next floor. Right. All that sound would have just shot right through. Mm -hmm. Your kitchen. And, yeah, you would have <laughs> had drums in the kitchen. And uh, my wife is very forgiving, but not that much. <laughs> so all of the ceilings are floated. Uh, some of the rooms have, I think, four nodes, and then like the vocal booth has, I think, three nodes. That's so great. I've got a nice like eight by ten vocal booth. Beautiful. And we, uh, we I use it for percussion. You can see there's some percussion in there. It, it's not dead. It's acoustically neutral. So when you walk in there, the sound doesn't just fall off. Mm -hmm. You know, it has some air to move inside of, but there's no real character to the room. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, going back to this other picture, one of the things that's kind of cool, if I want a super dead room, since the whole room is lined in this cleat, I can actually pull panels out of the vocal booth and just line the entirety of the room with those sound panels and totally deaden up the room mm, and get like the Don Henley thing going on. Mm -hmm. so Kids are into the uh, dry, dead drum sounds. They days. really sure. are. Mm -hmm. That goes was back to the tuning thing. That's right. <laughs> Lack thereof. Tape them down, <laughs> no. doesn't matter. Uh, sound replace them with a slate or whatever. Um, in the last couple of studios that I had before this, the room sound was the room sound. Uh, and I wanted a room that I could dramatically change within two minutes. Mm -hmm. And so between the wall treatments, the fact that the carpets are just area rugs that you can pull up or I can put more of them down. And I've got plenty of places to put room mics. Uh, in this picture, they're kind of up in a corner and we've got uh, a little bit of RLX foam in the corner to kind of knock the flutter echo out. Uh, I get a nice room sound. If I'm doing like if, uh, this kit that's sitting down there now with a 26 inch bass drum, Ooh. if I'm playing super loud, my room mics actually become overhead mics. Like if I'm just whittling them to mm -hmm. sawdust, mm -hmm. what I end up using my overhead mics for are cymbal mics. Mm -hmm. And then the room mics actually become what I would normally use for overheads if I were in a big studio that had really high ceilings. Right. And you'd back up those overhead mics maybe 10 feet or something. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what they, that's kind of the, the happy accident with this room. Uh, for playing loud, that's what the room mics end up doing. And you've got some stuff behind the room mics to kind of, you know, is that the Oralex? Yeah, yeah, that's the Oralex. Nice. I've got Oralex in the corners. Yeah. All the corners I put Oralex in. Sometimes I'll put the room mics behind me. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can kind of see in that shot, I actually Oralex those corners oh, too. Cool. Nice. And uh, that way I can put some mics back there and get a totally different sound there. Vibe to me is super important. So like even the foyer and the bathroom, there's a kind of a shot there you can see into my bathroom where we're sort of decoupaging the walls with uh, clips from different drum and guitar and music magazines and stuff. There's lessons, you can sit down. If you have to go to the toilet for more than about five minutes, you can read something and learn something. That was kind of my idea <laughs> with the bathroom. And um, just a place where, um, where you can go to, to feel creative. Yeah. So with my control room, I got a super, super nice roomy control room that uh, easily five or six people can sit in and, and not feel crowded. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was the problem with the last studio that I had was after you put three people in a control room. Couldn't breathe. Yeah, you couldn't breathe. It got, mm -hmm. it got sweaty in there quick, you know. So I wanted to make sure that I had plenty of space for people to sit and chill and and just feel relaxed. Mm -hmm. So, so for me, I'm running, I'm running Pro Tools HD, and I just went consoleless. So, well, technically consoleless. Uh, before I had the Avid S3 in the dock, I had uh, a Toft Audio ATB24. Cool. And when I was made my first big upgrade from my Mackie 8 bus, those were my mic pre. Mm -hmm. I had the mic pre's in that, which are a nice kind of warm, warmish British sound, kind mm -hmm. of a brown sound. And the EQs in those ATBs are amazing. 
But gradually, I started just adding mic pre's. I mean, you'll you'll notice I've got uh, some stuff from Focusrite. I've got uh, some Day King stuff in there, some Universal Audio. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lone Ventec uh, X73i in there that's just crying out for a big brother. <laughs> so at some point, I'll have to put a second one in there. Um, I've got a couple of uh, mic pre's that are sort of secret weapon mic pre's that if I tell you what they are, then I immediately have to execute you. <laughs> Uh, that are all tube based, and then I uh, I found when I went consoleless finally I still needed to have some inputs that would double as mic pre's if I need them. So I've got one of those Audient ASP 800s, um, which is eight channels of their mic pre. Two of them have got alternate circuit paths, mm. so you can actually change the character of the pre's depending oh, cool. on what circuit path you go into. Very, very cool. And so uh, and then off to the the uh, right there, I've actually got some old Shure. Um, they were meant to be PA mixers, mm -hmm. but you can mod them to make them mic pre's. So I had them modded as mic pre's. So uh, a lot of times I'll put either room mics in there or some of your special effects gacky kind of lo-fi mics. Lots of character. You, yeah, you vibe. can go through there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've been modded, so they have phantom power on them and everything. So cool. I've got some racks of uh, compressors. Just uh, pretty much every flavor that you can get from like Distressors to 1176 style, LA-2A style. Mm -hmm. uh, what's not in that picture is uh, SSL style, uh, a couple of different flavors of SSL style bus compression. Mm -hmm. And then uh, because I do some programming and some stuff in things like Ableton and Cubase, I've got a whole different workstation where uh, I do all of that work. And uh, so cool. some of that I'll do down downstairs, especially if I've got keyboard sequencing and stuff to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got one of those uh, Native Instruments machines, which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. uh, and then... Uh, you got a little tape machine over there, too. Yeah, right? yeah. I got a little four-channel tape machine that mm -hmm. I can either run mixes to, or a lot of times what I'll do is I can run kick and snare and overheads to it. Oh, good. Okay. So if I want to do a cool. drum bus, I can do that. If I want to do individual tracks, I can. But most of the time, I end up running kick and snare and squashing those, and then I can squash the overheads mm -hmm. and bring them all right back into Pro Tools and just have some all what I what people nowadays are doing with plugins. Uh, I'll do sometimes with the tape machine. Mm -hmm. And there's another little uh, in that shot you can kind of see. There's a little uh, uh, an Akai M7 tube. Uh, two-track tape machine that I'll I'll bust stereo drums to a lot of times, and then there's other parts of the studio too that um, in my my lesson and practice room mm -hmm. I've got a, a studio live in there, and both kits are mic'd up, so it's a 16-track recorder, and I'm using basically one side, you know, one through eight for the rock kit, and then like one through six for the jazz kit. Okay, cool. And so uh, really the only recording that gets done in that lesson room, that practice room, is if I'm practicing and I want to hear how I'm doing something, mm -hmm. I'll just, you know, I'll have the computer on, I'll just hit record, and I'll record whatever it is. If, I'm, if I want to play along to a track or something and listen back, I've got some nice reference monitors there. Get so the I can hear it. Back. Got yeah. it all wired up. Man. It's all wired, man. Awesome. It's all fun. Yeah. And uh, and then uh, instead of having one kit that does everything, which I really don't have one kit that does everything. My my whole. I don't know if that exists. <laughs> I've been trying to find. He that tries. Yeah. He tries. I, I, yeah. I, I tend to play the same kit for yeah. everything yeah. instead yeah. of changing Good it for out. You, man. Get obsessive about that kind of stuff. I'm like this kit. It's part of the journey that right. It yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and, and that's, that was, when I when I started putting this place together, really seriously putting together 12 years ago, I really wanted a place where if there was a sound that was in my head or there was a sound that was in my client's head, mm -hmm. then I could immediately get to that sound. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different drum options, uh, kick drum options, tom options, tons of snare drum options. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's over a hundred cymbals down there, so there's all kinds of different sounds of cymbals. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm a Peisty guy, but for recording, I've got all kinds of other weird sounds that, that Peisty doesn't make. I think workflow is a really important part about a studio and just trying not to put anything in between the creative juice that might come yeah. and, and the technology. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Because that's probably the hardest part is like when you have an idea or when you think of something and then you just have to turn on your computer and turn on all your mic pre's and plug in mics and then mm -hmm. it's gone. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's that's one of the reasons for me to have have a lot of that stuff sitting there is like 
that might occasionally I'll change like maybe what my overheads are going into. Mm -hmm. But nine times out of ten, they're going through the same Neve clones mm -hmm. because that's just a sound that I like for my overheads. That's what I use for mine too. The yeah. Avitas Audio uh, MA5s. Yeah, like a pair of those. The, yep. It's just beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great sound. So, mm -hmm. and, and 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 even if I do decide to change something, which I do occasionally, uh, it's it's as easy as a patch cable. Just mm -hmm. everything's on the patch bay. Boom, move that input to this thing, awesome. and and pretty much you're you're good to go there. Um, you know, different kinds of kick drum mics. Although the D112, ninety percent of the time, that's what ends up being on there. Mm -hmm. uh, oddly enough, what I change is what's on the outside of the kick. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I use a Solomon. Uh, which is like like a sub kick, mm -hmm. and as soon as I do a video comparing the two, I'm gonna have a sub kick for sale. If either one, of you, <laughs> if anybody out there wants to buy a sub kick, give me about two more months. Um, <laughs> I got two of them. I don't need another one. <laughs> but uh, but I've got uh, maybe a dozen different types of overhead mics, mm -hmm. so I can do a few different condenser sounds, fets and tubes, uh, a few different ribbon sounds. Uh, I can do just weird sounds. I've got for the a record, few Brian just sounds. took this from a home studio <laughs> discussion <laughs> to commercial grade <laughs> studio because you've just lost <laughs> half the crowd. Well, you know, I, and I tell you what, who inspired me? There, guys that inspired me to, to take it to this level. Um, I had a chance over the past few years, I've gotten to go out to L.A. and sneak out there for a few days at a time. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten to spend some time with some guys out there that have great home studios. And the one that sealed the deal for me, not to name drop or anything like that, but I got to spend a little time with J.R. Robinson. Mm -hmm. And that's what really made me commit. Mm -hmm. After I saw what he could do in his home studio, and once he told me, yeah, I don't really go into the city much. Pretty much do everything here, you know, awesome. maybe one day a week, a couple days a month. But most of the time people just send me stuff. Nice. You know, and you Chill walk it. in his living room and there are three different kits set up. They're all mic'd up and ready to go. Three very different sounds. Mm -hmm. And he has everything that he needs. And again, it's like for him, the way his studio is set up, if I need the sound that everybody thinks of as J.R. Robinson, that kid is right there. Right. He just sits down and he, pl he opens up the software and he... Hits record and he plays. Right. If he needs a vintage sound, if he needs a bop sound, mm -hmm. he's got everything sitting right there. And that really inspired me. And I thought, you know what? I need to commit. Mm -hmm. I, if, if I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it at the level that I want to do it mm -hmm. and I want to service the kind of clients that I want to service, I'm just going to have to go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it means not having hobbies <laughs> and uh, not taking a whole lot of vacations or, or weekends off. Mm -hmm. uh, then that's what I have to do, you know, and just and slowly and systematically, I've just added it a piece at the time over 12 years at this point. But that's the fun part going from the original cassette recorder oh, man. to what's available to us now. Yep. Yeah. You know, I started so. with the four track task cam thing. Those those were fun days. But, yeah. But then, then, like I said, I got the ADAT and the, you know, from then on, it just kind of kept going up. But the ADAT, you know, recalling those machines is just, it was hell. Yeah. Well, They're talk about awful. ease of use, not so much. Not so much. You know, you can't just go flip them on and yeah. start recording. I wonder, if, I wonder if anybody, like any hipster band, will ever be like, I just want that ADAT sound. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that crunchy digital sound. Yeah, just like bad conversion. <laughs> That'd be a great band name. Bad, bad conversion? conversion. Yeah. <laughs> The, the great thing that I've, I've just learned over time is that um, having your own place, your own creative space is great because um, not only can you fire up your own thing. I mean, if I want to write a song tomorrow, then I've got the tools. I can sit down. I can work on them. And if there's something that I need, I can either call my friends and send it out or better, if they've got half a day, I'll have them come over mm -hmm. and we'll hang out and everything's there and they can just plug in and let's play. Bring in an axe, bring whatever your favorite amp is, but the rest of it's kind of sitting there mm -hmm. and we can just kind of sit and be creative. And, um, you know, at two in the morning, if I can't sleep, I don't have to watch cable television mm -hmm. and infomercials. Mm -hmm. I can just go downstairs. Be creative. Be creative. Love it. It's awesome. Love it. And so, yeah, I mean, for no other reason, if, if, you, if you weren't looking to record stuff for your band, uh, if you weren't looking to try and get clients and do this professionally, if you're a dentist and Monday through Friday you work on teeth and you need a great place Saturday and Sunday to be creative. Or record your jingles. There you go. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Genius, yeah. right? <laughs> Just save all that money and do it at home.
do it at home. Mm -hmm. So, and so Dwight and anybody out there that, that is watching and is wondering if you're a drummer and you think, well, should I do something? You don't have to jump in whole hog and spend 20 grand. Mm -hmm. no. Yeah. You, know, you can start in the shallow end of the pool. Mm -hmm. And over time, you can add as you learn mm -hmm. and add as you have need. And, uh, and, and really, before you know it, you'll turn around, you'll know a lot more about not only recording drums, but how to play drums for recording. Uh, you, you may be of service to other people in ways that you hadn't even thought of because mm -hmm. you've, got, you've got the ability to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. So besides just doing drums, what are some other things that, Putting a studio in your house, what are some other avenues that have opened up for you for making money? Um, well, okay, besides just doing drums, yeah. I record, I'm fortunate enough to kind of recorded a lot of jazz records. Mm -hmm. So uh, having the grand piano in the house obviously came way after the drums. I mean, I set it up like just to record drums and then began building it out. And now I can accommodate, I've recorded nine, ten piece bands there before, you yeah. know, just kind of taking up everything, taking up the living room and uh, had somebody on the piano, I had a bass player in one booth, had a vocalist, three horns and nice. drums and everybody's yeah. got, you know, their own headphone mix and everything like that. So, um, you know, I'd say at this point, it's become about half my income is recording other people. Yeah. It, it, it wasn't my plan to do that. It just kind of kept building and building and I kept getting, I, I wanted more flavors of preamps, more flavors of mics and then I just, ended up having the facility to be able to have everybody in their own space yeah. and, and be isolated. And um, so, yeah, I mean, that's recording other bands, recording jazz groups um, has, has become a pretty large part of what I do. There's some other benefit to it for you guys out there that are thinking about, it, especially if you're a professional drummer. I think at this point in 2017, going into 2018, if you're a working professional at any level, even if you're just a wedding band drummer and that's the majority of the work that you do, or if you, you know, most of your income is teaching people, mm -hmm. but that's how you're paying your mortgage is as a teacher. I mean, I think drummers at this point, everybody that's doing this professionally should have some kind of setup. Absolutely. So that, I agree. So that you can uh, at first learn about it, but over time extend your reach. And like you're saying, it's cheap. Yeah. It's easy to get. I mean, you know, you, why not? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, for the cost of going to the beach for three days, you can add something to your house. Right. That you can actually make some money with and you can write off on your taxes. Mm -hmm. There you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so added benefit, probably the biggest benefit, right off on your taxes, folks. That is a big one. <laughs> <laughs> right? Thank God for tax. <laughs> oh. Well, you got anything else you want to add? Anything that you want to say to the, to the people that are out there? Because they're right there. They, they even call in occasionally when, when that works. <laughs> and we did cover a lot of ground today. So yeah. if you have follow-up questions, hit us up. We'll be glad to backtrack next yeah. week. Dialadrummer at gmail.com. Uh, you can also call us. There's a voicemail on that toll-free, 844 <laughs> Three, seven, four, two. This is like the third week. You think I know this? Nine, <laughs> niner. <laughs> Three, seven, eight, six. <laughs> People think that I put that number up there to uh, to to dress up the set, so it's just not all black. It's actually so that if I forget, I can, I can either look ahead or I can turn around and I know what the phone number is. So yeah, eight four four eight three three C three seven eight six is the toll-free call-in. Works all week. You can call and leave us a message. You can email us or you can put it anywhere on social media and tag us at Dial a Drummer uh, if you have questions. If you want to show us uh, pictures of your Absolutely. setups, We'd love by all means, it. we'd love to uh, feature a few of you guys on the show with, uh, with your setups and what you're doing so that other people can learn uh, more about what they'd like to do about what you've done. And if you have a home studio, I want to see those pictures too. Yeah. Yeah. By all means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, I need to get a new idea for the next thing that I'm going to buy, you know? Right. <laughs> There's always <laughs> something. It's, a, it's sort of like that Tom Hanks movie, uh, Money Pit. Mm -hmm. yes. There's always one more thing that's going to happen that you're going to need to get something. Yep. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so I promised everybody, speaking of one more thing to get, I promised everybody that we would have, uh, thanks to our sponsor, Waves Audio. You can go to dialadrummer.net slash waves and you can see all of the different specials they've got. But if you'll go directly to dialadrummer.net slash CLA2A, 
you can get the CLA Chris Lord Algae LA 2A plugin. Mm, it's normally one. like 250 bucks for that plugin. If you go to that URL, you can get it for $39. Nice. Mm. And the Good reason deal. the reason why I wanted them to have that on special, we want to put that link up is somewhere in every mix that I do, there's always a CLA 2A. Mm-hmm. It's just, uh, I mean, the LA-2A is one of those compression sounds that's on most every record that you love mm-hmm. somewhere. And I use the plug-in version of that uh, on almost every mix that I do somewhere. And it's so valuable to me. It sounds so awesome mm-hmm. that um, I wanted to make sure that we could have a ton of other people that could have that in their list of plugins. And not everybody's got 250 bucks. That's now, true. if you were to buy a real one, those things are like three grand. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but I don't just run out every day and spend three grand on a compressor. No. Nope. And I don't run out every day and spend 250 on a plug-in compressor. Mm-hmm. But 39 bucks, I almost don't even have to think about it. Mm-mm. So if, thank you, Waves Audio. Yeah, that. so Waves Audio, thanks for sponsoring the show. And uh, by all means, uh, dialadrummer.net slash CLA2A, and you can get that plug-in for $39. And uh, by all means, uh, anywhere as you're buying or registering for uh, that plug-in, make sure that you uh, let them know that you heard about it on Dial a Drummer, and uh, they'll see the uh, importance of continuing to sponsor this little show. And we'd done. like to thank our guest, Marlon Patton, for joining us today here in the studio. Uh, thank you guys for having hang. me. Yeah, it's been super fun. Yeah, if you get a chance, if you're in Atlanta and you see that the ATL Collective is playing and that they're playing some album start to finish, go I, check it out. I would say don't even worry about what album it is. Just go. It's gonna be it's gonna be a good cast. Yeah, good cast of musicians. Oh, yeah, sure. So, yeah. what's what are some upcoming things you guys are working on? Uh, well, the ATL Collective, I believe it's August fifth, sixth, fifth is uh, we're doing the Eat a Peach record, oh. Almond Brothers, nice. and uh, we're also doing. Another edition of that show is uh, pretty much, it's sort of a tribute to the ATL, uh, the Atlanta Pops Festival. And so we're doing a lot of the stuff from that. There's going to be some Hendrix and a band that I have, a duo that I have with Rick Lawler called Vice Hoond. Yes. W-E-I-S-S-H-U-N-D. Uh, German for white dog, because I have a white dog. Um, we are going to be doing some Hendrix. We're going to be, we're kind of part of the part of the act um, there, and we have a duo, and I do this wacky thing where I play uh, foot pedal bass with my left foot. Oh, very cool. Some, some Moog pedals, yeah. and play drums at the same time, and he plays shreds guitar and sings, and uh, so it'll be a good show. There's some there's some show. great video online. If you just do a little bit of hunting online, mm-hmm. you'll uh, you'll find some great video of those two guys, and it's pretty amazing what two uh-huh. guys can crank out in terms uh, of sound. Trying to make a big sound with two people. Yeah, man. Yeah, thanks. That's awesome. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks. thanks for coming and hanging out with us. Yeah. Thank you all for coming to hang out with us again and every week. We're here live every single Monday at noonish. Uh, Eastern <laughs> time. <laughs> We're gonna get it. We're gonna get it. We'll be st- 12 straight up by December, probably. (laughs) Uh, But uh, noon on Mondays, and then uh, if you can't catch us live, pretty much the recorded version comes out by about Wednesday or Thursday of every week on uh, YouTube, Facebook, and uh, pretty much anywhere that you see a social network, you can hunt us down and find out about it and watch or listen. So thanks so much for tuning in, guys. Thank you, Marlon. Yeah, thank you, guys. And uh, we don't have a tag to get out of this thing yet. That's okay. So we'll just tell everybody we'll see you next week on uh, Dial a Drummer. Stay classy, San Diego. Let's try something. We have some callers on the line, and this is the most callers we've ever had at any one time. Let's go. And let's, we've All got right. some other things we're going to talk about. We're going to tease it out a little bit. Uh, we've got a great Waves plug-in special that we're going to 
tell you about in just a little bit if you hang out. Um, we also are going to uh, talk about our individual home studios and our approaches to putting together our own personal recording spaces. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's jump in for a second and uh, let's let's grab a caller. Uh, looks like we've got our buddy uh, George Sandler is on the line. George Sandler. Oh. Where'd he go? You there? Hello, George Sandler. George. Do we hear George Sandler? Hang on. Hello, George. <laughs> no, no. Uh, this, is, this is the uh, the one thing about technology. That, <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Wah, wah. <laughs> Man, we built this thing up and built it up. Oop, I accidentally dropped something. We built this thing up and built it up. And <laughs> now, hang on. This is live, y'all. Oh. There you George go. Gone. That's uh, well, that's a uh, callback, George. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, we we'll go back to, to we'll, <laughs> we'll go back to the discussion. <laughs> oh, that was a. Uh, this is live, by the way. Yeah, did, I, did I mention that we're live on the internet? Hey, Amen. <laughs> Anything can happen. Yeah. Anything at all can happen. Well, let's <laughs> while while we're waiting for our callers to call back. Uh, hey, there's a, there's George right there. Let's see if we can get him in here. George Sandler, are we is that George Sandler? Are we hearing you? Hello, who who's on the line? How about I unmute that person? Uh, all right, we're gonna put you back in the queue. We're gonna figure this out in a second. Um, put you back in the queue. So let's uh, it's a live time. Dial a drummer. It was that close. <laughs> <laughs> almost. We almost got it. <laughs> we're gonna change it to try to dial a drummer. <laughs> yeah, attempt. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> Try really hard to dial a drummer dot net. Uh, anyway, so let's, I tell you what I do. Let's, um, yeah. hey, we're going to pause for just a second. I figured out what the problem is with the calls. What you got? Uh, we got Skype dumped us. That's what it was. Nice. Uh, Sorry, guys. Today's show is not sponsored by Skype. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Well, it's live, well, guys. It's live. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't talk over this because it, nobody will hear it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You got so this, this got whole time. It. George has been going, "Hello, hello." <laughs> well, he, the, the wonderful thing—they've been able to hear us. It's just when we swapped into them that. Uh, they could, we couldn't hear them actually. Oh, great. Okay, here we go. Talk about it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Tell, yeah. tell some. <laughs> it's live. Somebody's it's... dialing the drummer. <laughs> We're going live. <laughs> um. <laughs> so, yeah, talk about that with, with your, your, the actual treatment of the room yeah, yeah. to get some cool stuff happening. Turn that ringer off, boy. He's getting a session call right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, 